you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. We'll be reading this morning from Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and reading through verse 20. Mark chapter 5. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him, and he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him any more, even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs into the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. Let's pray. Father, I ask this morning that you would help us as we take up your word, that you would help us to approach it with reverence and honor, that you would help us this morning to see your son more clearly. And Lord, would you help me to preach your word clearly, concisely, and convictionally so that in the preaching of your word, People might be stirred up and sanctified, and if needed, someone might be saved by and through your son this morning. Father, we ask that you would help us to make sense of this text and to apply it in ways that affect our everyday life for your glory and for our good. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, I've titled this message, Drowning the Demons. Drowning the demons. And as I was studying through this, I realized that uh, we're not going to get all through all 20 verses this morning. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read, uh, we've read all of them, uh, but we'll preach through verse 13. And then we'll pick back up next week uh, with a part two of this uh, passage of scripture. Because in it, there is so much that I don't want us to miss. This particular passage really requires no introduction. Typically, I like to start off a message with an introduction of some sort, a story or an an analogy to grab our attention and point us to the Word. But really, this requires no introduction because it is in itself worthy of our attention. While there are a great many things we could draw from this passage, there's really just one thing I want you to understand this morning. I want us to see in no derogatory way to the last passage of Scripture that we read, that what we read this morning is even greater than what we read last week. If you were here last week, you remember that we read Mark chapter 4, 35 through 41, and in that passage we saw that Jesus calmed the storm, that He showed Himself as powerful, as sovereign, as in control over even the weather. And he called his disciples to have faith in him that what he promised them in verse 35 was that they were 
going to the other side. And so whatever lay, lay in between them and the other side, that really didn't matter because Jesus had already made the promise, we're going there. So whatever is in the way between here and there really doesn't matter. And Jesus showed himself to be in control of that situation. But again, in no way do I mean this in a derogatory manner toward that, but what we see this morning is much more important than what we saw last Sunday morning. If we were to be honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that although it is amazing that God is in control over the wind and the sea that they obey Him, what we see in this passage is that God is ultimately and finally in control over Satan and demons and all that would come against us. And that is immeasurably greater than his control over the sea and the winds. Now Sarah demanded that I give her credit for this because we talked this week about this morning's sermon. But she said what I think really sums up these two passages, last week's passage and this week's passage, well. Jesus can give you an easy life, as we saw last week, or he can give you a new life as we'll see this week. And immeasurably greater and more important is it that we have a new life in Christ than that we have an easy life on earth. If we have an easy life on earth and then die and have not Christ in our heart, all of it was meaningless. All of it was ultimately vain and void. And this morning in this passage, we'll see what God can do in terms of salvation for someone. And that is immeasurably greater than anything and everything else that Christ might do for us. I've often said before that if you have salvation and nothing else, you are immeasurably blessed. And you have it all. So this morning I want to dive right into our text with our first point, describing the demons. This man who is described for us in these opening verses finds company among the dead. The living man finds that he fits in best with the dead. He was from among the tombs, one who literally lived where no one else would want to go. Look with me at verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes, they being the disciples who had just crossed over the Sea of Galilee and had come to this rural countryside, the, the, the countryside of Gerasenes or Gadara, depending on which translation you're reading from. The same place. Verse 2, when he, being Jesus, got out of the boat, immediately, again, there's that word that we see 39 times throughout Mark's 16 chapter gospel, immediately. Very often when we see this word, it's not chronological, it's theological. It is telling us something that we need to pay attention to. It is telling us something that is important uh, that, that we pick up on immediately. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been broken or torn apart by him. And the shackles broken in pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Now first, I want us to see what this place is, back in verse 1, the country of the Gerasenes. It's right to call it the country. The Gerasenes is, uh, is, is still a place today uh, that can be visited in, in the place of Gadara or Um Kais in, in, in Jordan on the other side of Jerusalem. It is a place where we can go and, and find some archaeological evidences of the existence of its, uh, of its reality in this time. The Gerasenes would have been a place of a countryside. It was a rural country place. It would have looked a lot like Niffley or Campbellsville or Greensburg. This place isn't much unlike ours. This was and is to this day a very rural area. Jesus and his disciples had just left the crowd behind. Remember that back in verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1, he began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd had gathered to them. So this crowd was massive. Jesus preaches. And then after he preaches, Jesus is already in the boat in the middle of the sea to preach to all the people so that way they can all hear him. And then his disciples meet him in the boat and they go across the Sea of Galilee. And then they come to this place called Gerasenes or Gadara. This place was their opportunity to escape from it all. 
this place should have been a place of rest or respite. It should have been a vacation destination of sorts. That if we've been following along thus far in Mark's gospel, you know that it has been very fast-paced. It has been they're going, they're going, they're going, they're working, they're preaching, they're teaching, they're performing miracles. Ministry is on the ground running from Mark chapter 1. And here in Mark chapter 5, really this is the first time that we see any kind of moment of rest that they find. Because every other time that they had tried to find rest, they found trouble instead. And finally, they think, well, we're going to Gadara. We're going to a countryside. We're going to a rural area where not many people live. And not only was it a rural area, but it was a Gentile area, a non-Jewish area. And again, if we've been following along thus far in Mark's gospel, then you know that every time that Jesus and his disciples come across the Jews, uh, come across those who are Pharisees and scribes, they're challenged. There's a constant scathing onslaught of challenge and, and, and turmoil that the Pharisees and the scribes bring to Jesus and his disciples. And so the fact that this is a Gentile area, a non-Jewish area, should have meant that they were getting away from all the trouble and chaos, at least for a moment. But look what happens in verse 2. When he got out of the boat, immediately, a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Now just imagine this for a moment. I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of the disciples. And maybe you've been here at some point in life. Maybe you've just come through some difficulty, through some trial, and you think, oh, I barely made it out of that one. That was a tough time in life. That season, I, don't want, I never want to face another season like that. I've spent a month and a half in the hospital with that loved one. I've spent a month and a half in the hospital myself. The last several months, I've barely made it by financially. The last several weeks, I've been dealing with this sin that I, I just, I'm so glad I finally triumphed over. There is victory in Jesus, and I don't want to look back. Maybe you've been in that situation before. Look what happens in verse 2. Finally, they're thinking, we're going to a place of rest. We're going on vacation. Immediately. Immediately, as soon as they touched the ground on the other side of the sea. They had just come through this terrible, deadly storm that had terrified even career fishermen and boatsmen. Finally, they're past it all. Not so fast. Immediately, when they touch ground on the other side, in the city of Gadara, a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. In these verses, we see at least three ways in which this demon-possessed man is identified as unclean. He is identified as unclean, first and foremost, because he lives among the tombs. We're told that twice, in verse once in verse 2 and once in verse 3. A man from the tombs, verse 2, with an unclean spirit met him, verse 3, and he had his dwelling among the tombs. Now, it's not just that Mark was repeating himself because he was trying to fill up the page. Mark was not acting like a high school student who had a report due and it had to be 500 words, and so he was just making up words along the way and trying to fill it in with what he had just said a, a sentence prior so that way he can fill up the page and get his report due on time. He's repeating this for emphasis. This man was among the tombs. It was the living among the dead. It was a man who lived among the unclean. It was considered unclean for someone to touch someone who, has, who had died. It was unclean for someone to touch a corpse of any kind in that day. In fact, if you had touched a corpse in that day, you would have to go outside of the city limits for at least seven days and then be brought back and stand before the priest and be declared clean. And you would go through much like the lepers did and you would declare yourself unclean, unclean. This man was altogether unclean. Not only was he unclean internally because of the unclean spirit, the demonic possession that he, that he had indwelling within him, but he was unclean externally because he had touched or been among the dead. So powerful was this demon's influence that no one could bind him. Look with me at verse 4. 
because he had been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. No one else was able to keep him under control. No one in that day who had met him thus far was able to do anything about the demonic realm that had infiltrated this small country town of Gadara through this unnamed man. The only identification given about this man is that he was demon-possessed. And the only name given is Legion, the name of the demon, not the man's name. So unclean, so tormented was he by this demonic possession that he had altogether lost his identity. He had altogether lost his name. We're told in Genesis that we are made in the image of God. God says, let us make man in our image. Speaking of the Trinitarian Godhead, that we are made in his image. But we know that because of the fall, we are, we are a distorted image. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short. Present perfect tense of the glory of God. We are continually, always and forever on this side of heaven, falling short of the glory of God. Uh, let me put it in another way. I'm not glorious. I don't reflect perfectly the beauty and the splendor and the majesty of God. Uh, I, I would think you would agree. At least about me, and I hope about yourself. That we're not all that. We're not what we should be. We have, in a sense, lost our identity. Our identity is to be in Christ. And if Christ is not our identity, we are taking on a false identity. We are taking on something that was not meant to be. We were not meant to be identified with the devil. But this man is so identified with the devil and with the demonic realm that he has altogether lost his previous identity. He was so strong that no one could subdue him. Every time they tried to, their efforts were proven void. When no one else could, Jesus did. That's where we find ourselves in the next several verses. What no one else could accomplish, Jesus did. God in Christ Jesus came as the plunderer, the one who would destroy the works of the devil and the power of darkness. Now again, imagine that you are stepping off the boat onto the dry land and you hear what's going on in verse 5. Constantly, Night and day he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. This word screaming is in its original language literally shrieking. He was shrieking with a loud voice so that all the people could hear him. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, verse 7, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, I implore you by God, do not torment me. So again, we're in the shoes of the disciples. We're stepping foot onto this rural countryside of Gadara. And all of a sudden, we hear someone shrieking, screaming, crying out. And he said with a loud voice, he, he wasn't just whispering, because look back in verse 6. Seeing Jesus from a distance. He ran up and bowed down before him. Now, it's very unlikely that this man waited until he got in the presence of Jesus. It's very likely that all the way from the distance, however far away that was, that he's already crying out. He's, he's, he's a mile away crying out, what business do we have with each other? He's not just whispering this. And this is what you see as soon as you step into what was meant to be a place of rest. And they're thinking in the back of their minds, I thought we were getting away for a minute. What's going on here? The ministry continues. This demon-possessed man comes up, running up to Jesus, and declares that he knows who Jesus is. Verse 7, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Now I want us to take note of this. 
If you highlight in your Bible or underline or make notes in your Bible, I would encourage you maybe to underline or highlight what this demon calls Jesus. Jesus, Son of the Most High God. This is one of the only times until the very end of the Gospel of Mark. In fact, in Mark chapter 16, the last chapter of Mark's Gospel, and after the crucifixion had taken place, that anyone other than Mark himself rightly identifies Jesus as the Son of God. Back in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that Mark is writing to us about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark rightly identifies who Jesus is as the Son of God, but nobody else does up until this point. The demons are orthodox. They believe in God. James tells us that they believe in God. They are even terrified by Christ. They understand who He is, but they don't believe Him unto salvation. They believe in Him, but they don't believe Him. There's a difference. Now there's something to be said there. Because we need to remember who the demons are. The demons are fallen angels. They once dwelt in the very presence of God in the heavenly realm. And they were, according to Revelation chapter 12, cast down with Satan. Satan himself being an angel. So they who dwelt in the presence of God knew who God was. They recognized Jesus as the Son of God, as the second person of the Trinitarian Godhead, the eternal and everlasting Son, but they didn't believe in Him to salvation. There's an application in there for us. Maybe you've grown up in church. Maybe you know all the right things. Maybe when you were in grade school and you participated in Bible trivia, you knew all the answers. And you got all the gold stars by your name. And you got the little blue first place ribbon that said that you were just the champion at Bible trivia. You know all the right things in your head. But you don't believe them in your heart. Maybe that's where you are. You have heard the gospel time and time again, but yet you still deny the truth of it and your need of salvation. You still run from Him. You still neglect reality. Well, that is, if we are to consider it to be the very same behavior as this demon, it is demonic, foolish behavior. It's of the devil. This man's uncleanness is pervasive reaching down to the deepest recesses of his being. So penetrating was this possession that the demons filled an entire herd of swine when they were cast out from the man. He was tormented day and night, it tells us in verse 5. Constantly, day and night. Constantly, he was tormented by this. And yet in verse 7, he says, I implore you by God, do not torment me. He's already being tormented. But he's too blind to see it. His eyes aren't yet open at this point. Such is the way of the devil. Satan hates human beings who are made in the image of God. The devil is not your friend. Sin is not a game. It's deadly. It's deadly. And the devil here is blinding this man so that he thinks at the end of verse 7 that Jesus is more dangerous than his sin. Because this man isn't ready to let go of his sin. He isn't ready to let go of what is holding him. As long as we are holding on to our sin, we cannot be held by Christ. We're being held in hostage to our sin. And we need to come to Christ ready to lay it all down before Him. Sin is deadly. And the devil would love to 
have us believe that it's not. The devil would love to have us believe that, oh, it's just a small sin. Uh, That sexual sin that you're caught up in, it's just a small thing. Everybody's doing it. No big deal. That denial of God, don't worry about that. He'll let it slide. All that cursing and cussing that you're doing, that foul mouth that you have, that if you were still living with your mama, she'd make you wash your mouth out with soap. That's not a problem. That's just the way people talk nowadays. No, it's not. It's sin. And sin is deadly. Sin takes possession of us if we're not careful. Verse 8. For he, being Jesus, had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. This man had all sorts of sins. He had all sorts of things going on in his life. But I'm going to give us a spoiler. Although this man's sin was pervasive, although his sins were many, Christ's mercy is more. Although this man's demonic possession was great, Christ's grace is greater. So you this morning who are in this room, I don't care what you're going through, Christ is still able to save you from it. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking in that sin. It doesn't matter how deep you've gotten in it. It doesn't matter how far you've run from God. Christ is able to do far more than you could ever imagine. And He's going to do it here. Our second point, drowning the demons. Look with me at verse 10. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, to be entirely honest with you, I don't know who's talking here. I don't don't know if it's the man himself talking or if it's the demons talking because what we see here at the end of verse 9 is he said to him, my name is Legion. So there we have the demon talking on behalf of the man, right? Uh, So in verse 10, I, I don't know if it's the man talking or if it's the demon talking there. But whatever the case, they're really one and the same at this point. Verse 10, He began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. Now, what I want us to see in verses 11 and 12 is the parasitic nature of demons. The parasitic nature of sin. Sin doesn't just want to hang out in the abstract. It doesn't just want to exist. The devil's not good with just being the devil. The devil wants total possession. If we read in Revelation, that's what happened in heaven, right? The devil was jealous of God's authority. The devil was jealous of God's dominion and reign and rule. And so he said, I want some of that for myself. I want to be God. I want to be the ruler. I want to be the one with dominion. He was jealous and rebellious. These demons are parasitic. They're like parasites that need to be attached to something. And that's why they're imploring Jesus, send us into the swine. Uh, Just let us attach ourselves to something. Let us be sinful somewhere. And Jesus gave them permission in verse 13. Now this is interesting. That Jesus gave them permission. We're shown here that God is sovereign over Satan. In Romans 16, verse 20, we read this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now that's sort of a juxtaposition. 
it doesn't make much sense that the God of peace is going to be crushing someone. But the point there is that in order for us to have true peace in this life, we're going to have to crush some things. We're going to have to destroy some things. We're going to have to have some strongholds break, broken down. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. In Matthew 8, verse 29, in Matthew's account of this very same narrative, the demons ask our Lord, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now this phrase, before the time, is similar to the phrase used in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, which says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. There's one slight difference between the two, though. In Matthew 8, verse 29, the word used for time speaks of a specific time, a specific date and historical event that would soon take place. Whereas in Galatians 4, verse 4, the word used for time instead refers to a general and broad spectrum of time, a period of many years. Now, as a young earth biblical creationist, I would affirm that the earth is around 6,000 years old. We remember in the Genesis account of creation that God created all things as mature. He created man and woman able to procreate. He created the trees able to produce fruits. He didn't create everything as seeds and then they grew up over time. He created everything as mature and living. And so if we look at science, it's difficult to tell the age of the earth based only on science. But if we look at history, all of the historical records would suggest that there was about 4,000 years in the Old Testament. And we're in 2023, if anybody's forgotten the calendar year, which puts us around 2,000 years in the year of our Lord, or since His incarnation. So what is the time that it's talking about in Matthew 8, verse 29? The demons understood that there was going to come a time when Jesus would crush them, when Jesus would destroy them. Dr. R.C. Sproul helps us here. In his commentary on Mark's gospel, he says, both the demons and Jesus knew the time for their final destruction was not yet at hand. Again, in Romans 16, verse 20, and in Genesis 3, 15, we're told that Jesus will crush Satan. We're told that Jesus will come to plunder the kingdom of the devil, to overthrow the kingdom of the devil and to usher in His own kingdom, the everlasting kingdom of God. Jesus, in the opening chapter of Mark, comes preaching in the city of Galilee and says the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, Christ's kingdom is here and the kingdom of the devil is going to be gone. It's going to be crushed. Just follow with me for a moment. In Zechariah 2 verse 12, we're told that the Lord will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Well, what did he choose Jerusalem for? What was Jerusalem or Israel chosen as God's people for? Zechariah 3 verses 1 and 2 answer that for us. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now notice that it doesn't say an angel of the Lord there. It says the angel of the Lord there, which is Christ. So here's this vision that Zechariah gets of Jesus telling the devil, I'm going to destroy you. There will come a time when you will be crushed when you will be rebuked, and that time will come out of Jerusalem. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, a small city within the limits of Jerusalem. 
Jesus came out of Jerusalem. Jesus is the one who will crush the devil. And as we look at the cross of Christ, we see that he crushed the devil. In verse 13, it says, Jesus gave them permission to come out. The unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Now, some people have actually considered it a criminal act of Jesus to send these demons into the swine and to send the swine into the ocean, into the sea, and to destroy them. Because in destroying them, remember again, they're in a Gentile area, a non-Jewish area, and so the Gentiles would actually use these swine as financial gain. It was their livelihood. So for Jesus to send these swine into the sea, some more liberal theologians would say, was a crime because he stole from those people their livelihood. Well, I think two things we need to know really quickly. One is that pigs were and are today considered unclean for the Jewish people. So for Jesus to send those demons into the swine was just a further indication of their uncleanness. Remember I told you that there were three ways in which this man was defined as unclean or identified as unclean. This is the third. Those demons were sent into what was then considered unclean. The second thing, again, Dr. R.C. Sproul helps us here saying that Jesus was not displaying a lack of compassion. He was exercising proper compassion. He was willing to sacrifice 2,000 pigs, as valuable as they were, to rescue the one demon-possessed man. It is as if Jesus was saying, this is a human being, a creature made in the image of God, who is being destroyed day and night by these demons. Whatever it takes, I'm going to redeem this human being. So before we charge Jesus with a lack of compassion, we need to see that it was his compassion that drove him to destroy the pigs for the sake of one human life. That is how valuable human life is. Only in a culture of death where human life is denigrated do people value animals more than people. So we should not look at this as criminal that Jesus was taking away from the livelihood of some. But instead we should see in it the great compassion of Jesus. That he did whatever it took to save this man from his possession. And I would submit to us this morning that he's done whatever it took to save an old sinner like me. And he's done whatever it took to save sinners like you. And what it took was a blood sacrifice. And not just the blood of, boat, of, of goats and bulls, but the blood of the Son. That is why he came to crush Satan. Jesus was willing to sacrifice the swine no matter what for the sake of this one man. And not only was he willing to sacrifice the swine, he was willing to sacrifice himself. That's the gospel. That's the good news for us this morning. Is that Jesus has paid it all. One hymn speaks of this beautifully. I stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me. Confused at the grace that so fully he proffers me, I tremble to know that for me he was crucified, that for me a sinner he suffered, he bled and died. Oh, it is wonderful that he should care for me, enough to die for me. Oh, it is wonderful, wonderful to me. Friends, I don't know where you are this morning spiritually. I don't know your heart, but you do. You know where you are. You know if you're trusting in Christ. You know if you're living in sin. You know. You know how wicked and sinful may, you may be. You know how weak your faith may have grown. 
you know how strong your faith may be, and in so knowing how also God is worthy of all the glory for that strong faith you possess, you know. Whatever it may be, whoever you may be, wherever you may be spiritually, I want to point you this morning to the Savior. I want to point you this morning to the fact that Jesus came and did what He promised He would come to do. And He did it on behalf of whoever would come to Him in salvation. For sinners just like you and me. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your power. We thank You for Your strength that You have displayed in the person and work of Your only begotten Son who was sent to this earth to be God incarnate, the true God, the true man, the, to, to, be, uh, to be God in the flesh, that He would come and die for sinners like us. That He would come to redeem His people. And so, Father, I ask this morning that for those of us who are in Christ, that You would encourage us, You would remind us of just what lengths You went to to save our souls. If there's anybody here this morning who does not yet know You under the, the eternal salvation of their soul, would You save them even now? Break down their strongholds. Whatever it takes, Lord. Bring them home to You. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.